Frank Wides, Jeff Patterson is our guest, our Canucks reporter who took in the proceedings at the Climate Pledge Arena in Seattle last night. And Jeff, you were telling me not Rick Talkin wasn't just spitting fire post game, but he was visibly shaking. He was seismic in his anger about that game last night. Yeah. And look, I'm not there. I go to a lot of the games, but I come back and I record rink wide. I'm not always there around the coach post game and certainly not in a scrum format where you're literally rubbing elbows with them. Like that was more my takeaway was you could feel his anger in his body language as much as you could hear it in his words. And, and he was mad and rightly so they were terrible. You know, they played well against Winnipeg and lost. They played well in Denver and lost. That's going to happen. They played brutally in Seattle and lost. And that's where there is a line that, yeah, as a coach, and he tried to take some of it on himself and sort of take a couple of bullets for the team with the thing about not being prepared. I get it. I mean, that's from the coaching handbook. But this, to me, was more on the players than it was on the coach. Although, you know, this power play thing is so out of control now. And you can see it's in their heads. And, you know, every power play out was a different so they're just throwing stuff against the wall. But for all the talk in the lead up to the game about more shots, despite the formations, four shots in eight minutes, power play time, nothing to show for it, one for 28. And it is uh, a disaster right now. And there's too much talent for it to be as bad as it is. But, you know, that was part of the problem. But the other thing, guys, is four straight losses. They've opened the scoring in all four of these games. And that's usually been the blueprint to success for the Canucks. So they're not getting bleached. They're not getting, you know, teams aren't steamrolling them from the opening minute it has been stay in games and usually the formula has been get the saves you need get the goals you need your star pl- players take over in crunch time and that's not happening for the vancouver canucks right now there there was plenty within the rant b-a-l-l-s uh, no shows <laughs> what what specifically stuck out to you jeff in terms of the words oh do something come on like he's stealing <laughs> my material now um, and honestly, like I had to stifle a bit of a laugh when he, when he dropped that I was like, Hey, uh, but, but trust me, those words were in my mind as I watched that game as well. Just about any time anybody hopped over the boards, I was like, do something, somebody here. Uh, cause look at the goals they score. Like JT Miller gets a fortunate bounce. Grubauer's lost his stick and Sam Lafferty probably still hasn't seen that puck go in, but, uh, they count, but you know, in terms of generating offense and actually creating scoring chances, like they didn't do anything against the Seattle Kraken and Philip Grubauer, guys. That was his second game since December the eighth. Like, talk about a guy that hasn't played much. He is the backup. They got thrown a bone by Dave Haxtell and the Kraken. Like Joey Decord can't play every game, but Decord has been a big part of the Kraken's resurgence. And they see a guy that uh, probably has a little bit of rust on him. And they had twelve shots on goal through two periods. So, uh, I mean, the do something thing certainly stood out, but just more about the fact that. You know, I think, and, and he's used this line, or at least sort of gone down this path before. About if guys think this is playoff hockey, if they think this is love tough, that one, yeah. Um, and he's so right. A, a game in February against Seattle, that's not playoff hockey. Like the Kraken are desperate. Yeah. I get that, and, and credit to them, they were able to play their game. But yeah, I mean, the stakes are going to get significantly higher, and for the first time all year. Uh, even through three straight losses, I was like, you know, they played reasonably well and lost. You can live with that. But four straight losses, like that can quickly become five, six. And you've seen teams in the East have now caught them uh, in points and points percentage. They're a little bit fortunate right now that everybody else around the top of the West is kind of scuffling. Uh, and so teams aren't making up a ton of ground on them in the West and in the Pacific. But you are opening the door to some of those teams uh, closing the gap and working their way closer to the Vancouver Canucks unless they get this turned around and figure it out. And that's at the feet of their best players. And I think, and again, talking didn't name names, but it's pretty clear, you know, Elias Pettersson hasn't been great. Elias Lindholm really hasn't been great other than the two games in which he scored. And Brock Besser has gone into hiding, which is unfortunate because he's had such an incredible season, but one goal since the All-Star break. And that came in that third period when everybody was scoring in Minnesota the other day. They've won periods lately, but I don't think we've seen them dominate anybody. And I'm even going back like to even pre All Star break. I don't know if there's been many moments where they have looked like a first place overall team that just said to somebody else in opposition, "You can't stick with us. You just can't hang with us." We haven't seen that at all. And you look around, and other teams do that. Like even even in a uh, in a in a close game, 
I was watching the end of that Bruins Oilers game and David Postrock was just like, nope, we are not letting this game slip away after our lead. And he just willed his team and, and just sniped a goal from the top of the circles that, you know, few people in the league can do like, Where's that moment from the Canucks over? And again, I'm talking a wide sample size here. Give, give them the last three weeks. I don't know there's many opportunities or many, uh, you know, games to point to where they've just looked like a first overall team. Sorry, you're not in the same league as us. Yeah, I would agree. And I, I think you go back to that barnstorming road trip through New Jersey, New York, the Islanders, and Pittsburgh, where, you know, and the lotto line was doing a lot of the damage then, but they were bullying good yeah. opponents. And just yeah. get out of our way. You're not stopping us. And we haven't seen that. Like, they came off that road trip. They went 4-0-1 in the five-game homestand that led to the All-Star break, but they didn't play great there. I remember, they let the Leafs off the hook. Uh, they kind of scuffled to beat Chicago and Arizona. They had the St. Louis and, and then the Columbus comeback. So, you're right. Like, complete game start to finish. They've been hard to find for the Vancouver Canucks. And, again, that goes back to this idea that, you know, they're not giving up the first goal and chasing. They're getting leads, but they're not be able to do anything with it. And so outside of JT Miller right now, nobody's going. And so your point is well taken about Pasternak. Like, you know, Nathan McKinnon didn't dominate the game, but he had 10 shots the other night for the Colorado Avalanche. Mark Scheifele had four points against the Canucks. Kaprizov and Eriksson Ek each had six points in Minnesota. Jared McCann had four points last night in Seattle. So, you know, they're letting other teams' best players take over and their best players aren't matching right now. And, and that's the disappointment, I think, for Rick Tockett, for the fan base. And, you know, just watching with my own eyes in person last night, like, where is the investment? Like, you, you get out of the first period and one all tie, you haven't played well. But, like, that should be sort of the alarm bells right there to hit the reset button and be a whole lot better. And they just didn't dig in at all against the Kraken. And once they fell behind, uh, I know they tied it at two with the lucky bounce, but... You know, look what happened. Like that 4 2 goal, lose a face off cleanly, and then just standing around like Rick Tockett and all of his staples. <laughs> You're not going to win defending like that. You can't. And yet, we've seen too many examples of that uh, of late from the Vancouver Canucks, who right now do not resemble that team that rolled through the New York area a month ago. You uh, you made reference to the Hughes post game comment about uh, bringing other people that will work on the like. Is that just him throwing out like a catchphrase? Are we reading too much into it? Because it sounded like he had he knew the guys were in the hopper in the on deck circle ready to come in here. And there's only I, one Bill Castle. I found a little bit of levity in that moment. I'm not yeah. really sure what he meant, but yes, yeah. this idea that if the guys that are here can't get it done, the Canucks are going to somehow find it. Like, does Phil Kessel have friends with him on this uh, little trip uh, into Abbotsford? You know, is there a, a behind door number two somewhere? <laughs> like, yeah. I, I, no, it's on their best players. And, you know, again, like I put it at the feet of the players, but I do think the coaches ultimately make the decisions. It was curious at the very least to see the first power play of the night. And your leading goal scorer and leading power play goal scorer, Brock Besser, isn't on power play one to accommodate Philip Peronic, who was supposed to shoot the puck, and he didn't shoot the puck. And then the next time out, Besser was there, but Lindholm wasn't. And by the fourth power play, this idea of Heronic blasting shots, Heronic wasn't on either power play, first unit or second unit. And that's where I say they're they're just throwing stuff at the wall right now and hoping something sticks. The problem there is, guys, like, one power play goal doesn't cure all. One power play goal might help them in a game somewhere, but the next time they score a power play goal, like that doesn't put an end to this discussion. They've got to find uh, just authoritative looks. It'll, it'll be ruthless. Like what happened to that group that before the all-star break and for much of the early part of the season, you know, they were relentless on the power play. And right now it's just so passive, so static. And again, you can just feel it's in their head. There's no doubt about that. Maybe Quinn Hughes is being consulted on trade deadline yeah, targets. Maybe, maybe. Just putting it GM. out there. Yeah. Uh, he is the captain now, of course. Here's the other thing. As much as Rick Tockett's words might have been hard to hear and landed with some authority, I'm going to guess that there was a Canuck or two who got it even worse from a dad. <laughs> <laughs> After going 0 for 3 on the dad's uh, trip. Jeff, and uh, you were telling us, um, sadly, it wasn't a full complement of dads on this trip. There were some uh, missing father figures. Yeah, I mean, first of all, and, and I think this is the right way to do it, and we're seeing this around the league. They're framing it as fathers, they call mentors. it the mentors trip, right? Like, yeah. 
first of all, not everybody has a father. We know Brock Besser and uh, his family story there. And I think there are some others uh, that have lost their dads. There are some that come from blended families. Like I think Sam Lafferty had his stepdad on this trip. Others had brothers there. So, um, you know, it's not simply every player and his dad because uh, there are family dynamics at play. So I like the idea of it calling it a, a mentor's trip. Whatever the case, yeah, I mean, look, the guys want to perform for their dads, and they did in Colorado. Again, the, the effort in Colorado was fine. They lost to a, a good Colorado team in the third period. Uh, last night was a letdown. And, you know, I, I do think it bears mentioning at the very least, guys, that this was their 10th game in 17 days coming out of the All-Star break, eight of those 10 on the road. Like, that's just a massive ask. That's not me trying to make any excuse or be an apologist. That's just a lot for professional athletes. And if you think back to November, they had a similar 10-game and 17-day stretch. They lost in San Jose in the 10th game. Like, it just shows you that it doesn't matter who you're playing – by the time you get to 10 games in 17 nights with a bunch of travel, you don't have much left in the tank. And so I do think that that was part of the storyline. Now, I'm sure the Canuck organization was hoping having the dads around would you know, boost them. They had the day off in Seattle on Wednesday, a little bit of energy. It was interesting, too, though, because they've had this tough, condensed schedule, there has been next to no practice time. Like A guy like Elias Lindholm has come in and had to learn on the fly. And so I think you do have to cut him a little bit of slack in that regard. I know he's a pro and a veteran, but this is new to him still. And so now it's this catch-22 of when you get some time off, like do you just let the guys have days off to recover and recoup, or do you try to drill down to put an end to this four-game losing streak? So uh, the dads will scatter. They'll go their separate ways. And, yeah, it's a little unfortunate that uh, they had to witness this one in person. Uh, it was kind of fun to watch them uh, – you know, during the morning skate uh, in Seattle, uh, all decked out in their, wearing their uniforms, the kids' uniforms, to the morning skate, not just the game. So uh, they were all in, uh, certainly. And, you know, I'm sure they appreciated the opportunity. You guys had Brent and Deb go on, listening to Doug Cole, Ian's dad, on the telecast the other day as well. Uh, you know, look, this is a fleeting opportunity. Like, even for the guys that are in their 20s, you know, careers are short. And so I think that the dads value it. And I, and I have to imagine the players... Uh, absolutely in a long season, uh, get a kick and, and maybe a little bit of energy out of having dad or a mentor along for the ride. Well, Mr. Demko said he was going to stick around for Boston. And I yeah. and I wonder if he's not alone. I wonder if there's a few sticking around and it might be some uh, a chance for redemption for the dads. Uh, no, well, Mr. No, Mr. Patterson. On the, that was my understanding. I When okay. I saw the photo from they had all the players and the dads, I, I didn't see Elias Patterson's dad. Uh, hmm. And I, I know what he looks like. I don't know what all the dads look like, but yeah. uh, I certainly yeah. would recognize Elias Pedersen's dad. Uh, somebody told me that because they fly on the team charter and there are manifests and logs that are filled out, the, the dads all had to fly back to Vancouver yes. before they were able to. Right. So Correct. so I think a lot of them would stick around. I mean, the Boston Bruins and right. the Canucks yeah, come course. on on a Saturday. Yeah. So the dad's trip, yeah. uh, the, the trip part is over, but the dad's part, maybe not so much yet because the Canucks are at yeah. home now for three in a row. So probably. I'm not leaving. I'm not exactly. leaving until, until, I, until, I, get, I, until I, I get a win. Exactly. I would also bet there were a couple of dads. I'm not leaving until I see a better effort, son. <laughs> <laughs> we are not parting company on that Seattle effort. There's a there's a 12:30 Canucks practice conducted by Rick Tockett today at UBC. There's a 2:30 practice. That's the dads right. they're gonna put the put yeah. the players through their paces. That'd Jim Hughes is out there finding ice right Jim now. Hughes, we yeah. are bag skating at 2:30, gentlemen. Yeah, Coquitlam Planet yeah, Ice. Exactly. Third sheet. Bring your skates. You won't need a stick. <laughs> Oh, man. Um, let's ask you the poll. Uh, what's more upsetting about Elias lately? The play or the unwillingness to sign the contract? Or are you totally unbothered by Elias these days, Jeff? No, look, he's well within his rights to sign when he wants to sign. So I've sort of put the contract aside. I, I think it's just more about him getting back to being a star level player. And he has been quiet, as a bunch of them have, since the All-Star break. And I guess I hope that the arrival of Elias Lindholm was going to bring out the best in both of them. And there just really hasn't been that chemistry yet. Uh, there have been some moments along the way. But uh, Pedersen, let's see, two goals since the All-Star break. And he's got some points. But I think six of his points came in two games against the Detroit Red Wings. So it's kind of been feast or famine in that regard for him. Uh, I think the other thing, too, is, and, and look, I get that he's a hot-button issue. And there's a bit of a flashpoint there with him. People have to understand, though, that even in a quiet stretch here, 
if he has back-to-back 100-point -back seasons, the market is set. Like, it is what it is. He's getting his money. The Canucks mm -hmm. have a decision to make there if they want to be the ones to pay it, ultimately. But you can't negotiate because he had a slow month of February and say, well, now you're only worth $9 million. It doesn't work that way. The market is what the market is for star players that have back-to-back 100-point -back seasons. Those guys get paid. And so, you know, again, like I hope that there's an uptick in his performance, his production, and certainly, you know, the scrutiny is going to come at playoff time, and he has to deliver for it. Like, he is such a huge part of this team's success. He was early on. Uh, he's gone quiet. The team's gone quiet. I mean, there's a correlation there without a doubt. So um, the contract thing to me is now a little bit on the back burner just because I think we all have come to understand that it's not like, now. I, you know, the trade ted deadline can be a bit of a pressure point and there's other decisions that have to be made by the organization. Like, I, I get all of that, but just in the here and now and for the poll question, to me, it's just his performance when other teams, top players are starting to torch the Canucks. I want to see some guys wearing Canuck uniforms match that. And JT Miller's been productive. He's got eight goals since, you know, only Austin Matthews has scored more goals coming out of the All-Star break league-wide. And we're talking about uh, Austin Matthews. So JT Miller... Uh, he's holding his own, but they need some other guys, and that's where it comes back to Pedersen. And, and, big well, and here's the other thing. Jeff is absolutely right about a slow month of February not affecting the price. Here's the other thing. Even if he were to have a terrible playoffs, like if the Canucks were to land with a thud in the playoffs out early, stars not being stars, and let's face it, wouldn't be the first young team no. to suffer that playoff fate. That, that might affect the Canucks' view of him. It's not going to affect his compensation because no. others will yeah. others will pay it. All it takes yeah. is one, and there will be 30, 31 teams salivating over over his availability if it comes to that. Yeah, I right. And, and like just to, you know, if he had a sluggish second half of the season, he's still going to get a hundred points. Like I, I think, like unless the bottom completely fell out, and that's where I say the die is cast for guys that put back to back seasons together. You might be able to nickel and dime a couple of hundred thousand dollars maybe but everybody's slotted i mean that's just the way the open market works in the national hockey league and so you may not agree that he's a 12 million or 12 and a half million dollar player but that's what the market is going to bear and that's where it comes back to this idea the canucks then have a decision do they want to shell out that kind of money for this player or do they want to see what that kind of player could you know return them uh, in some sort of trade. The one price I think that can get affected with a slow finish to the season, and that includes the playoffs, is if they are forced to trade him, I think you might get a little less for that player mm, I don't know. if he's not rising to the occasion. Yeah, I still think it's a very robust market. Um, but yeah. if you don't believe he's a different, like we're seeing, like J full credit to JT no, Miller. Like JT Miller's rising to the occasion here. I I'm just saying, to Jeff's point, if he's a two-time 100-point player, That'll be good enough for a lot of GMs, coaches. Well, no one's doubting markets. that that player adds to your team. Mm -hmm. But again, is he the guy that you can lean on? If he doesn't prove right. it, himself to be the guy that you can lean on, then he's a he's the he's your number two on a team. And, and you're, number one. you're absolutely right. But in markets like Ottawa and Columbus and Buffalo, like it's just hey, we got this player. That's good enough, yeah, right? Like yeah. they just need some upward mobility, some some momentum. In their operations. Uh, Jeff, it's a four o'clock start against the mm -hmm. Boston Bruins. Bruins get the leaf stream. Yeah, here seriously. On a Saturday night. I got to say, I'm a little off put by that. Even, I don't mind the earlier starts on the Saturday. In fact, um, depending on the weather, in some cases, I prefer them. I like them, yeah. Um, but they're getting the Leafs treatment round. Right. And, and I've seen some outrage already. I, I push back with do you know what the Canucks record is against the Leafs? at Rogers Arena over the last 15 years, it's like 13-2. and two. Like, mm -hmm. the Canucks have absolutely feasted on the Toronto Maple Leafs in this 4 o'clock window. Here's the thing that I haven't been able to get to the bottom of. Hockey Night in Canada has the Toronto Maple Leafs at Colorado at 4 o'clock on Saturday. Like, marquee matchups don't come a whole lot more. Austin Matthews and Nathan McKinnon for a national audience? Like, what are we doing here putting the Canucks and the Bruins sort of on another channel up against that. Like there are lots of weeks where you look at the hockey night matchup and you think that couldn't they have done better with the schedule? Well, here you got the abs and the Leafs and you get the Canucks and the Bruins. So I don't know why this is a four o'clock start, but it's a quick turnaround for the Vancouver Canucks. The Bruins are coming off back-to-back uh, -back games in Alberta, uh, one in Edmonton lost in overtime. So they've been to OT the last couple of games. Uh, 
you know, look, the Bruins fed the Canucks in Boston two weeks ago. That's going to be fresh in the Canucks' minds. We know Canuck fans never forget that kind of the thing. So um, 2011 probably doesn't resonate with a lot of the current Canucks, although we were talking on the quite last night that, you know, Arsky Baines, he certainly would know the story there. Um, but otherwise, it's just, you know, it's going to be added emotion, energy in the building, because Canuck fans don't forget. A win over Boston obviously ends the losing streak. I don't know that cures all, but boy, if you think there's angst right now, you know, they fall to the Boston Bruins on Saturday. Oh boy, uh, for five in a row. Whoa. We got a show on Monday. Yeah, we sure do. <laughs> uh, and you'll be in for Blake on Monday. Have yes. a great rink wide. We'll be listening Saturday and we'll see uh, we'll see you here in studio next week. Uh, yes, I have to uh, hit the highway and make it uh, home from. I came a long way to watch that last night. You did. Mm. Happy travels. <laughs> hey, everybody. If you're enjoying what you're seeing here, then follow along with Secure Some Price on YouTube. I promise more content coming. It, they call it, the kids call it subscribe on YouTube. Well, how about liking it? Do that as well. Smash it right now.